Well, this morning I'm going to expound on how to defeat a giant. Seems like a children's lesson, but we're going to learn how to step out, step up, and step in. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, we thank you for your presence and I thank you, Lord, for the victory that's in this church this morning. Thank you for the sense of expectancy that's here, Lord, and I expect you to move amongst us. <clears throat> I expect you, Lord Jesus, to guide us and direct us into a deeper revelation of your truth. And I expect, Lord Jesus, that you'll do more than challenge us. That you would change us. Give us confidence and hope and victory. Lord, that we'll defeat a giant. So God and direct. Lord, now we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Many of us are very familiar with the story of David and Goliath. We've heard it since we were wee little kids. But the Lord gave me a word this this week. And I know it sounds a little mystical, but bear with me. That's kind of how I am. I was praying about this morning's sermon. I, I do that constantly. Every week, and that's just how I—that's how I come up with messages. I pray with something I come up with. The Holy Spirit will lay something on my heart. And this this week it was very vague. I couldn't shake this one phrase. What do you stand for? What do you stand for? It really challenged me. Is the Lord can give us one little sentence like that and work it into our heart, and you start really sitting there thinking, What do I stand for? What do I really stand for? And it wasn't until later in the week that the Lord gave me three different, really, options to preach that phrase from that I'd never realized. One was Elijah, and I thought, well, yeah, you know, he stood for God against an entire nation that had turned their back on the Lord, but the Lord had reserved 7,000 people, you know, a remnant. Thought of Peter, how he stood against the whole sway of the world, uh, the whole sway of the, the, the Jewish nation again in the second chapter of Acts. But what really stuck with me was David and Goliath. It's like, you know, I've heard that story my whole life. But it wasn't until I started looking at it in Scripture for the sermon really just popped out of me. It really just popped out of me. What do I stand for? So I entitled this message, How to Defeat, How to Defeat a Giant. And we'll see that David done three things. He stepped out, he stepped up, and he stepped in. He stepped out, he stepped up, and he stepped in. Now I'm going to give a disclaimer. This message, <clears throat> this message um, may sound pretty harsh if you're not willing. But I want to also remind us that we are called to step out and step up and step in. And if you will listen to the principles that are about ready to be preached and expounded from God's Word, you will find victory in your life this morning. Now, I can't guarantee much, but when God's Word says it, I believe it. And I guarantee it, you will find victory this morning. So we're going to be looking at 1 Samuel in chapter 17. The Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter 17. And these are three principles we all must exercise in order to slay the giant. 1 Samuel 17, beginning at 31, verses 2, or verse 31 and 33. Now before we get there, just a little bit of background. Here you have enemies of Israel coming, Philistines standing there in direct opposition to Israel. The Israeli army standing there, scared. Their king is scared. These people are giants, a big, a massive army, very powerful. And here comes a little shepherd boy. We all know this story, don't we? He took time out of his day tending to his flock of sheep. Now, you all already know how the story ends. He takes time out of his day to tend into that flock of sheep just, just long enough to come down to 
destroy this giant, the general of the Philistine army, and he does it with a slingshot and a couple of rocks. By the way, Pastor Nathan just got back. Sarah was telling me this is this is last week. When was it yesterday? Was it yesterday? He just got. Or, Oh, a couple of weeks ago, he just visited the spot where all of this took place. Got a little rock from it as a souvenir. He'll tell us more about that when he gets back. It's a literal thing. It's actually happened, in other words. It's actually happened. He will say, well, why don't we see giants today? You do. If you look around at science, they're absolutely there. Like the tallest man in the world was like 10 foot 5 or something. Against the world records, you can see that. They're still around today. <clears throat> so here's this giant. David comes. He slays it. He's a little good-looking shepherd boy, according to Scripture. And he comes and he slays it. So here's David coming up to King Saul, the guy that's afraid, willing to even give his armor, put it on this boy, he won't slay this thing. We'll see here what David, with this little event that took place, this one specific event that took place. Now when the words which David spoke were heard, beginning at verse 31, they reported them to Saul, and he sent for him. Then David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go out and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. So in order for David to defeat the giant threatening his nation, according to Scripture, he stepped out of three things coming up to this event. If you turn just a couple of pages back, you can see in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13, first thing David stepped out of is he stepped out of the world. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from the day from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Now what we need to see here that's important is right after that semicolon there it says, And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David. You cannot have the Spirit of the Lord upon you while you have the Spirit of the world still within you. You have to step out of the world. In order for David to do this, to be anointed as a priest, he had to step out of the world. Guess what? God still offers this to Christians today. It says that we are, in the God's Word, anointed as kings and priests. <clears throat> we have to step out of the world in order to have this anointing of the Holy Spirit. This is Jesus' anointing. You know, I'm working toward my ordination right now, and there will be some men praying over me next June, and I'll be an ordained minister. It freaks some people out that I even pastor a church. If you're not ordained, nobody's ever prayed over you to put their hand on you and all that. Said, no, I never have been, and the Lord's blessed my ministry ever since. I have an anointing that's far beyond that. It's the anointing of the Holy Spirit. God's Holy Spirit helps us. God's Holy Spirit is our power, is our blessing, is our anointing. Well, Bill, how did you get that anointing? I had to surrender and crucify my own life, surrender myself to completely and totally and continue to abstain from this world. In order for David to be able to have this anointing, <clears throat> he had to step out of the world. The second thing that David had to step out of was he had to step out of the expectation of others. That's a hard thing for somebody, some people. He had to step out of the expectation of others. If you look at 1 Samuel 17 and verse 28, just a few chapters through a few verses from where we read. Now Eliab, his whole oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was roused against David, and he said, Why do you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. Now what did Eliab expect? Here's David's older brother, not very nice, is he? He said, I know you're prideful. I know what kind of person you are. You're here to watch the battle. What did David's brother expect of him? He didn't expect a whole lot out of him. Did he? he didn't expect David to go down there and show up and deliver them from Israel. He expected far too less out of David. See, and oftentimes we as Christians let other people define who we are. We let other people's words really sink into our heart. We let the lies of the devil start really convincing us of who we really are. But I'm telling you what, in Christ... You're a new creature. In Christ, you're a whole new entity. In Christ, you're a whole new thing. You're a terror. 
to the devil. You're a terror to evil. You're a terror to this world. And we need to understand that. <clears throat> we need to understand. If you're really going to go deep with God, you cannot have your, your power, your attitude, or anything governed by the expectations or the words of other people. Matter of fact, everybody who's ever went deep with God has been ridiculed by other people. Whenever I planted this church, one of the greatest advisors I've ever had, missing dearly, he said, Bill, people will, Satan is going to use people more than anything else to stand in your way planting this church. And he's been right. We have to understand a couple of things dealing with people. Our war is not with flesh and blood, it's with principalities and powers. And Satan is still indwelling people and tempting people and making people hate us and say hurtful things to us. And we're just going to have to grow up and just say, you know what? These words mean nothing because God's Word always trumps them. I know that I'm right vertically, so horizontally people may hate me, but you know what? I'm still going to impact this world for Christ and I'm going to keep on going. My vision goes far beyond what people think of me. When we start thinking five and ten years in advance what we're building, what we're doing, what we're thinking about, what we're investing in now, the words of people will not mean much anymore. <clears throat> I think it was, it was definitely Leonard Ravenhill used to say, the man who is intimate with God will not be intimidated by men. Now David, if he was a weak man, would come down and here's his older brother in Jewish culture. The older, older brother was a big deal. And he would have said, man, my brother just don't even believe I can do this, so I don't think I can either. I, just, I wish people would believe in me and turn around. I'll tell you what. I, I wouldn't be standing here today if I was relying on people believing in me. I'm just being honest. <clears throat> Matter of fact, if you really start getting serious with God, your life's going to get incredibly lonely sometimes. You'll feel like you're the only one. That's the truth. So don't rely on people. Don't live up to the expectancy of others. David, at a very young age, figured out who cares what other people think. Well, that statement's not true. Because we always care what people think. You know? We will always do that with human beings. But we cannot let that stop us. We cannot let that stop us. We must see the giant that needs slain. We're a nation that we've taken over. Next thing David done, or another thing, not the next thing chronologically, but another thing David done, we see in the scripture that he stepped out of the crowd. 1711, he said, When Saul and all of Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. All of Israel, even their king, scared to death of this giant. Even their king said, We cannot do it. Even their king was sitting there trembling, saying, What are we going to do? This king, if you'll look at verse 38, said, So Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put a bronze helmet on his head, and he clothed him with a coat of mail. You know what significance that is? The king's armor. He said, you know what? I might be king of this nation. I'm not brave enough to stand up against this giant. But buddy, if you want to, you can have my armor. That's how, how scared they were of this thing. That's how scared they were of this thing. I like what David did there. In 39, he said, David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these for I have not tested them. So David took them off. David said, you know, I'll try this armor on, but you know, if it's not working, man, it just ain't working. I'm going to go up, I'm just going to walk out there in my clothes. i got a slingshot, i got a rock and wood. <laughs> it's, and he, was, he stepped out of the crowd. You know, the whole sway of the Church of America will tell us to do something that we, it, that, they'll tell you to do one thing. It's, at one point, it's going to come, I believe this is my personal opinion. I think it's going to come down one day that they will probably in this country put Christians in concentration camps. I think we're heading in that direction. I think it's probably far past that. As a whole, I think that we're probably past that point. We're just heading there. And what happens? What happens? If somebody comes and knocks on your door and says, Are you a Christian? Well, the church down the road, they all said they weren't. They're still having church or whatever at so-and-so's house. But if you deny Christ, you deny Him now, He's going to deny you in front of His Father. 
we have to step out of the sway of popular opinion. We have to step out of the sway of what's going on around us. We have to quit comparing ourselves amongst ourselves and saying, well, this Christian's doing this, so surely I should be able to do it too. You know the thing I like about Operation Save America is their slogan, Jesus is the standard. If Jesus wouldn't do it, we can't do it. That's the way Christianity works. You're a follower of Jesus. And here's the, here's the key to this, guys. The vast majority of the church is not living that way. And God's eyes are looking all over this earth saying, where's my remnant? Who are these who are willing to step out for righteousness when nobody else is doing it? Who's willing to go and slay the giant when nobody else will stand up? Are you willing? In order to slay this giant, David did three things. He stepped out of the world. He stepped out of the expectation of others. And he stepped out of the crowd. Doing what's Christian will often not be what is popular. Second thing David did is he stepped up. Looking at verse 17 and picking up at 31. Um, I'm sorry, 34. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep and when a lion and a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear and his this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Listen to the, the tense he has in his voice right there. He wasn't, he wasn't saying, oh, I hope this turns out good. He's, he's going there with confidence. He's saying this certain uncircumcised Philistine, he's got no, he's got no bankroll with God whatsoever. This will be nothing. I'll take care of this. Moreover, David said, The Lord who has delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me at the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, the Lord be with you. In order for David to defeat the giant threatening his nation, according to Scripture, David stepped up with three things. First thing he stepped up with, we cannot negate this, we cannot ignore this, he stepped up with experience. He stepped up with experience. The Bible tells us to not let a man be in ministry that is a novice. I wish I had listened to that one the first two and a half years of my ministry. I'll tell you that firsthand. I, I wish that I would wait. But I wanted to just jump right in and nobody told me not to, so I just jumped right in there and made a mess of things more often than I did any good. He was not a novice. He had experience. He knew what he was getting into. He said there in 34 and 36, but when a lion came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it, struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. He said, your servant in 36 has killed both lion and bear. The uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. In other words, David's saying, this ain't my first rodeo, brother. You give me a rock and a slingshot and I can take care of this thing. <laughs> this ain't no big deal. This ain't nothing. This ain't nothing compared to a lion. Ain't nothing compared to a bear. To a bear. I've got this. I've been there before. You know, I've tended sheep. You know how dangerous it is to be a shepherd. I mean, you've got everything in the woods looking after these helpless little creatures that are worth so much money and and are so sweet and nice and cool and kind. And they're just fun to be around. I love being a shepherd. David said, "I love my sheep and I love Israel and I'm willing to step out. I'm willing to step up." And I've got experience in this realm. If I've slayed a beast, I can slay this beast. I'll take care of this, or I'll die trying. In 1737, this first part of it, he said, Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw and the lion, the paw of the bear. So he wasn't just going from experience in a, in a humanistic standpoint, saying, Now I've been there, I've done this, I know what I'm doing, I've got. Now what he's really saying is, I've been there and the Lord has delivered me before. See, you can build a church, you can build a ministry, you can build a life in one of two ways in the Christian realm. You can build it on your own strength and it will fail. Or you can build it in God's strength and say, I've seen the Lord deliver. 
Now, you know, just, just like with this church fan coming through here, that was a big step of faith for me. I've never prayed in something like that before in my life. I've never stepped out like that before in my life to that degree of money. But the Lord said, here's $4,000 by the middle of July. You step out in faith and I'll give it. And I said with confidence in God, I believe that you can. I believe that you will. But that wasn't the first time God's asked me to do something like that in faith. And then the end of that story is, by this Friday, we should have a church meeting. In the middle of July, God's came through. He already said He would, and He did. But you know, I've asked for provision in many other ways. You know, it, I've asked for other things. God's always met my needs. Matthew 6.33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And I wish people would really believe that verse. If it's God's will, He will always supply for it. If it's not God's will, He will not give you supply for it. You don't have to worry about pursuing it anymore. He's saved you from that heartache. That's the way it is. That's the way the kingdom works. That's being part of that kingdom economy. You can know the will of God by that way. I think it was, was it uh, Gideon that said it's like throwing out a fleece, right? You just say, all right, this is the Lord's will. He'll provide for it. I think it's the Lord's will for us to get a van. It's the Lord's will for us to put a church here. It's been the Lord's will for us to have children's ministry upstairs. It's been the Lord's will for to provide for me and have it. It's been the Lord's will for me to get to the detention center. He gave me a car to be able to do that. I was in ministry early on. It's been the Lord's will to do a lot of things because He's provided for them specifically. What I'm trying to say here is, He stepped out, David stepped out in assurance, knowing that the Lord had delivered him before and the Lord will do it again. He's going to do it again. He had assurance of faith. That is an assurance in God. See, we've got to separate what faith is here. Faith is not merely believing there is a God. You all understand that? Biblical faith is not believing there's a God up there somewhere. I mean, my goodness, there's heathens that believe that. Biblical faith is not even praying. Hindus pray. You know that? Buddhists pray and meditate on sacred texts and things. We do that. Faith is not coming to church. You understand? That's not saving faith. It's not. Plenty of people come to church every single Sunday and they're not saved. They don't have saving faith. They live like a heathen all week and come to church and think they'll get on the head. Let me tell you what faith is. It's not believing in God. It's believing on God. Not in, but on. There's one letter, a little one letter difference in those two words, but it's so significant. See, like Hebrews 11 says, by faith Noah built the ark. God, you called me to do this. I believe it will get me through it. By faith, we enter into repentance. We're saved by repentance and faith. What is repentance? Turning from sin and trusting God to keep you from sinning. It's a two-part equation. Faith is always accompanied by action. And David had assurance by faith. He said, you know, by faith, God's delivered me from the lions. He's delivered me from the bears. By faith, He'll deliver me from this Philistine who's uncircumcised, doesn't know God, he's a pagan, who cares, I'm taking care of this fella. God's already said He would, and I'm going to take care of it. He had an assurance in the God that He knew. And you can't have that assurance, Christians, unless you really know God. Can you say that you know God? That you know Him personally? That's where that assurance comes from. And you get to know God in an instant, and that knowledge grows over time and in depth. He had an assurance that his God would deliver, deliver him. So he stepped up with experience, he stepped up with assurance, and then he stepped up with authority. Authority. Now watch this. In chapter 17 and 37 it says, And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Go and the Lord be with you. There's two things that his authority came from here. The first one is obvious. The second one you might have missed. The first one was, the Lord be with you. Well, David knew that or he wouldn't have showed up to the front lines. The Lord be with you, Saul said. So David went out with authority. Knowing that God, and I'll tell you something, as soon as you're saved, you've got that kind of authority. 
As soon as you say you're saved, you've got victory over the devil. You know that? Just as soon as you're saved, you can come to the Lord in faith and say, you know, Satan's trying to buffet me today, but I'm telling him to leave me alone because you've got authority that goes so far beyond this earth, so far beyond this world. The unsaved president of the United States, whoever it is in office, does not have that kind of authority. You understand that? God has given us Christians heavenly authority. Authority that comes from the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Judge of Judges. He can give you that kind of authority today. Authority over sin, authority over the world, authority over the devil. Authority to have faith and know that it's going to come through. It's a heavenly authority. It's a faith that moves mountains by the authority of God vested in you. And David knew that he had it. But, notice what he said there. Notice what God put there. And Saul said, this is the authority that most Christians, I believe, in the church today miss. Is that we are to respect and submit to governing authorities above us. Whether it be your boss at work, whether it be the President of the United States, whether it be a policeman, whether it be your mayor, your county judge, the circuit judge, the law of the land, that is all authority on the top of us. Notice that David did not ignore that. He went to Saul. And Saul commissioned him to do it. Could David have done it without Saul's permission? He probably could have. But that wasn't the realm of, in which Saul lived. Or in which David lived. David respected the authority that was over top of him. If you read the life of David and his interactions with Saul all throughout 1 and 2 Chronicles, you will also see, or all throughout 1 Chronicles, you'll also see that David never, never ignored that. Even when he was completely in the wrong, Saul was, and treated David like garbage, David still respected that office. Well, let that sink in with you a minute. You know how much joy is being robbed from people's lives today because they don't understand this principle? You know how much joy is being robbed? You know, people getting, getting angry instead of submitting? It's easy to get angry. Any weak person can get angry. It takes a real, real person, a real brave, noble person consecrated, sanctified, spirit-filled Christian to say, I know, this is, I know this person is not even fit to lead. This person is willing to take the armor off and put me on it, put me in it. But I'm going to respect them anyway. Submit one another, the Bible says. For further reading, you can go into Romans 13. I'd like to know more about this in our Bible study on this time. We'll be touching on it again. David stepped out with two things. The authority of God and the authority of man. I, I would have, this church would not be here if it wasn't for those two things in my own life. God told me that the KMHA approved me. Without the KMHA's approval, we wouldn't be here. Because I'm under the KMHA, I respect everything they teach. I uphold everything they teach, and I respect the authority above me. Have I ever thought they might have been wrong about something from time to time? It doesn't matter, though. They are my authority. And I will live under them. I will uphold them. You know what about the law, the policeman? Speed limits? It's authority, guys. And a consecrated Christian lives under that. Fudging your tax papers. Fudging on disability papers happens all the time. Transgressing authority, taking advantage of the system that's already put in place at that point. And then the people who really need to don't get it. What if we had a whole nation that lived under authority? Probably would be wasting so much money. Just saying, instead of putting anybody's clothes in open line. Just saying, though, this is biblical principles. Know how to defeat giants in your own life? 
You step, step out from the world, step out of the expectation of others, you step out of the crowd, then you step up with experience, step up with assurance, and you step up with authority. Then, a lot of people don't make it that far, and especially to this last point, you have to step in. You actually have to do something. <laughs> you actually have to get involved. It's not enough. Dare I say this. It's not enough for me to pray that abortion would stop in this country. But it is enough for me to pray until I have the opportunity to go and get involved in some way and stop it myself. An intercessor, somebody who prays, is someone who stands in the gap. That begins with prayer. Oftentimes, not every time, but oftentimes, must end with action. What if David would have never slayed that giant? He had to step in. In order for David to destroy the giant threatening his nation according to what? <coughs> Scripture, David stepped in to three things. Beginning in verse 745. Then David said to the Philistine, You come, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. So where was David's faith? He stepped in with a faith that slayed the giant. We all know how this ends. He stepped in with a faith that slays the giant. It wasn't enough for David to come to the battle. It wasn't enough for David to go to the king. But it was also enough for David to confront the giant. Do Christians live the same way? Yes. There's a battle raging right outside this place. It's not enough for us to come to the king. We better be willing to stay up, step out and be the answer to our prayers. Be the answer to our prayers. We have to step in with a faith that slays God. You think you can't do that. Think, well, I'm not equipped to do something like that. I don't think I can do that. Good, you're in a good place. Because you can't. You have to have faith that God can through you to slay the giant. David stepped in with a God-given strategy at hand. It's not enough. You can ask my staff this. It's not enough. I'm being transparent. I have a hard time with this one. It's not enough for us to just do things on the fly, just run out and just blind faith. That works out sometimes. But not, you will never build anything that will last more than five years. Really. I've learned that the hard way. I'm getting more, this is just me being transparent. I'm getting more intentional about that in my life. I've lived that way for far too long. You've got to have a strategy. You've got to know where you're going. You guys need to know where we're going. We have to have a strategy. We have to know where we're going. We have to have goals to achieve. He, David stepped out with a strategy to slay this giant. He said in 17, in verse 40, that he took his staff in hand, he chose himself five smooth stones from the brook, and put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. He had a strategy. What was the strategy? Have you ever thought about this in any deep way at all? You ever gave this much thought? Here is a man who is a giant who is so much bigger than David. It's the same reason an elephant's afraid of a mouse because a mouse can run all over the inside of an elephant. An elephant can't do much about it. They try to stomp around and try to avoid it. You can't outrun it either. So here's David about ready to face this giant. What's the first thing he thought of? Military strategy would tell me this, this army is much more capable than I am up front and up close. I need something that's a distance. Bit. I need something that will keep me at bay from the distance of this man's spear, that will keep me at bay from the distance of this giant's sword. I need something that's small enough that he probably could not even see it coming so he can block it with his shield. But I'm going to take something small and use it and stretch it just as far as I can to destroy something large. See, it doesn't matter the amount of ammunition you have, and it doesn't matter what kind of things that you have going into this battle. 
God will use it if you'll step out in faith and do it. That's what David saw. He said, if you'll step out in faith and do this, I will take care of this. I will take care of this. David didn't use human humanity's armor. He didn't use any other things. He just stepped out with a slingshot and faced one of the mightiest generals in the known world at that time and wiped him out, cut his head off with his own sword, by the way, telling you. Why? I can tell you this. It's because he knew his God and his God gave him strategy. His God said, this is how you will do this. I can, or he would not have even chosen it. I can promise you that. It doesn't really say that much in Scripture. But David was led of the Spirit of God. And if you're led by the Spirit of God, He'll give you wisdom beyond your ears to do things in the You sure will. <clears throat> so David stepped up in with a faith that slays giants. David stepped in with a God-given strategy in hand. And David stepped in, as we see in verse 47, in complete confidence in his God. With in verse 47 it says, Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with the sword and the spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hands. Can you imagine? <laughs> here's this Philistine army. They were probably laughing at this guy. And here's this kid showing up with a slingshot to slay this mighty man. Now he's a giant because he was tall, but in Hebrew there's a couple of different meanings for the word giant. Giant also meant the person's stature, the person's sway, the person who they were. He was a giant of that land. I mean, he was like, this guy was a hero. I mean, he was famous. Everybody knew him. Or he wouldn't have been the head of their army. Here comes this little shepherd boy with a slingshot. He takes the head off of their mighty man effectively slayed this giant. <clears throat> he stepped out in complete confidence in God knowing that he couldn't do this on his own and he wanted the Philistines to know here's your example. The Lord does not save the sword and spear. This battle is the Lord's. He will give you it to our hands. He stepped in with a faith that proved it. He proved it. He stood up and he proved it. What are our applications? Well, there are plenty of applications from this one passage. This is one of those passages they say it preaches itself. You could apply it to just about anything. But I believe it was from the Lord as I was praying over this, as to how to conclude this. There's a specific thing I believe the Lord, the Lord wants us to focus on today and it's not just slaying a very tall person, but they are giants in the United States of America today. You understand that? And I'm not talking about people. What I was really drawn to by the presence of God the other night in prayer, last night in prayer especially, was what the Philistine giant Goliath represented. As I just said, Goliath was a Philistine. If the ancient Philistines would have taken over, had taken over Israel, they were a pagan culture. If Goliath's forces would have eventually defeated the Israelites, it would have meant that their country would be overrun with a religion that worshipped several gods. One of them was Baalzebub, is what he was called. Not being confused with Bezalbub, which will be used for Satan yet. Baalzebub and other fertility gods and goddesses which we see from other pagan cultures are most often most often worshipped by sexual immorality and child sacrifice. Sexual immorality and child sacrifice. The Philistines may have lived side by side with the Israelites, the ones that had, decided, the ones that had survived that battle which would have been few. But the culture would have been changed. The worship in their temples would have been changed. The people, as we've seen over and over and over in Scripture when the Israelites came in contact with these pagan people, they were changed. Most often, into degenerate, sexually immoral people. 
and you saw that Jezebel slay the children. Offer their children as sacrifices to their gods. Does that sound familiar? Sounds like the United States of America to me. It certainly does. We live in one of the most sexually immoral places in this world. You can't even turn on television without seeing what ten years ago you would have seen on Cinemax. Now you can watch it on mainline TV and in the, in the main stations. You know, I don't even, I'm getting attached now. I can't even remember what they are. CBS, NBC, Fox. They're doing pretty ugly years ago. Now I don't want to camp on this, but I want to give you a <clears throat> number I'd like you to memorize. 59 million 599,000 Four hundred and fifty-one. I want you to memorize that. Fifty-nine million five hundred ninety-nine thousand four hundred and fifty-one. That's the number of children <clears throat> that have been ripped out of their mother's womb in this country since 1973. how so many children have never had a chance at life. 59 million. 599,000. 451. And every second it's going up. The number is rising. Here's another shocking statistic about the United States. 62% of Christians in the United States support gay marriage. 62% of Christians in the United States support gay marriage. 62% of Christians deny the Word of God in the United States of America. And it ought to make us furious and angry Place. And we lay back saying, well, people do what they want to do. Who am I? I don't want to judge Jesus. Yes. In a lesser note, but I think it's equally as significant because it shows the heart of the church today. 49% of Christians still enjoy, pay for, and watch rated R movies and above. It entertains them, which shows you exactly where their heart is. A heart after God is a heart after darkness. We live in a dark time. We live in a dark time. Christians today have absolutely very little revelation of the holiness of God. Very little revelation of the majesty of God. Very little revelation of the God of David to slay the giants that are in this world that are in this world and in this country. And we've got giants here today. And I don't want to lose you on this, but I'm telling you this. We've got giants that have to be slayed. And the only people that are going to stand against this is Christians. You understand that? We are salt and light. And we cannot be mixed with this world. And we cannot step out and step, we cannot step out of the world and still try to remain in it. We can't step out of it on Sundays and Wednesdays and go and live in it the whole rest of the week. It doesn't work that way. We'll never be useful to God and you'll never go to heaven as long as you live that way. You understand that? Christian salvation delivers you from darkness and delivers you from sin. People will not get away with it. If you don't believe me, you can hear the words of Christ that says in Revelation 21 and verse 8, but the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers and idolaters and all liars will have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And who will rescue them? The Christians. We are soldiers fighting against ideas fighting against principalities and powers, fighting against giants in this world. What happens when you stand against these things? You're a bigot. What happens when you stand against these things? You're intruding on my rights. What happens when you stand against these things? Oh, you're just one of those old fuddy-duddy Christians that won't go to the movies with me anymore. Well, good. Hallelujah. 
You don't need to support that morally corrupt Hollywood system anyway. The entertainment system is controlled by the Satan himself. We're standing against much bigger giants than Goliath today. And I told you all the rest of that message to encourage you and to get you going fire and realize that there's hope. You know the reason America's in the shape that it's in today? Some people call it a Christian nation. A Christian nation, that's ridiculous. Even the Christians ain't not Christian. We're a pagan nation. Pluralistic at best. It's time that we own what we are. Stand for the Bible. There ain't no reason for somebody not to be born walking into an abortion home before they murder their child. No reason. Too many churches, too many Christians, too many people claiming Christ. No reason. No reason. There's no reason people should not be confronted with their sins. There's no reason. Too many Christians, too many soldiers, the army of God. There's no reason. One of my very favorite scriptures in conclusion is this right here. The first part of 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11. It's a sentence. It says, And such were some of you. Oh, I love that scripture. It has so much hope in it in six words. So much hope in it. In six words. And such were some of you. Because the scriptures before it do not leave any stone unturned. 6, 9 through 10 says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, that's sexually immoral people, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Oh, that sounds so judgmental, don't it? Well, it is judgmental because it's the Word of God. The Word of God is quicker than any two-edged sword, and it will divide bone and marrow and joints, it will tell you exactly what's wrong with you and then expect you to believe it to be delivered. Let me read that again. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. That's a list of giants in this land right now. The pornography industry is costing more pastors than anything in this world. Rather, more pastors are leaving the ministry because of pornography and sexual immorality than any other thing. It's a giant in this land. It needs to be slain. And Christians are the one called to slay it. I'm pointing my finger at you. What are you going to do about it? Are you willing to step out, step up, and step into this fight? One thing to hear an encouraging message about what somebody did 3,000 years ago, it's another thing to apply directly to your life and confront the things that are going on today and win them. Win them. They can be won. And such were some of you. And such were some of you. You know what that word, what that, that my favorite little verse there is so significant? Because that tells me there's not a single giant on this planet that cannot be slain by faith. People got to know it. People got to hear it. You know why 62% of the church is in favor of gay marriage? Never heard otherwise. And if they did, they didn't hear it in authority enough to, for it to be for them to be delivered from that idea. Yeah, I'm getting a little raw. The Holy Spirit can make you angry, and it's healthy. It's healthy. Don't believe me. Look to Jesus and flip the tables over in the temple. I think he was pretty outraged at one point. And I'm outraged this morning. But we have more churches, more Bible schools, more Bibles, more Christian radio and TV and all kinds of things. But Sixty-two percent of this nation has gay marriage. And that's just one of many things. One of many things. What are we going to do about it? I'm afraid it's going to be like the days of Jeremiah. This verse stuck out to me. Thus says the Lord, Stand in the ways and see. Ask for the old paths. 
where the good way is and walk in it, then you will find rest for your souls. That's where we need to be. Amen. Isn't that where we need to be? We need to get back to the old past. We need to confront sin for what it is. We need to, it's not whoops and uh oh, I made a little mistake. It's sin. It brings people down to hell. And it don't do me any good whatsoever to stand up here and tell you otherwise. I'd be lying and I'd go to hell right with somebody if I didn't do the truth. Now, here's a sad thing. Here's how this verse, that verse 6, 16 ends in Jeremiah. But they said, we will not walk in it. In other words, these people walked right up against their conscience in the days of Jeremiah. Lord judge them for you. Where's your conscience at this morning? <clears throat> Are you willing to bear rejection of this world for Christ? The word that God gave me this week. And the question I believe that now looms in eternity for each and every one of us. Where do you stand? Where do you stand? Jesus, we just do thank you and praise you for this opportunity. I thank you, Lord, for who you are. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are our standard. I thank you, God, that you're here to deliver this morning. Lord, this is a call to action. I pray, Lord, that we would step out in power and in faith. And the Lord, we would not be afraid of rejection anymore. We would not have the fear of man. Lord, we'd get intimate with God and be intimidated by no one and we would stand, Lord Jesus, and, and walk in the blessing of standing for God in the midst of a world that today is suing people for doing otherwise. And Lord Jesus, we lift up Canada to you who are threatening to take children out of homes of people that stand against homosexuality. Lord Jesus, this is going to move upon us, Lord, if we don't do something quick. And I pray, Lord, <clears throat> I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would stand against the giants of this day. And I pray, Lord, we would stand in confidence. We would stand, Lord, without any fear. We would stand, Lord Jesus, doing what we've been called to do, being salt and light in this fallen world. And this world is so wounded, Lord Jesus. And we know that when salt goes into a wound, it will burn. Lord Jesus, it also stops the wound from bleeding. We want to ask and pray, Lord Jesus, that we would be able to stand against the slave of these times. We would stand against the giants of our land. We would stand against these giant ideas, against <clears throat> evolution, against the protection of marriage, against the murder of the unborn. And the Lord, that we would not sway. That we would be people of good character, doing all that we can to stand. So, Jesus, would you help us this morning as we sing this last song to make a decision, Lord, not just to be challenged, but to be changed, Lord Jesus, to no longer fear man, but fear God, and fear what sin is going to do to this country and the generation behind us, Lord Jesus, if we don't see a mighty revival. Oh, God, would you help us help the church this morning to help the Lord Jesus. I pray for a fresh awakening in this country.
So sit by you and bring the lost to me. So sit by you, my strength to know the weakness, my joy and grief, my perfect peace and pain. To bring my power, my grace, my promised presence. So sit by you. So send I you to bear my cross with anger. Then one day, with joy to lay it down, to hear my voice, welcome my faithful servant. Come share my throne, my kingdom, and my crown. Lord Jesus, I'm thankful that you sent us. Now, Lord, help us to go out. Pray earnestly for your power to be equipped to go in with a strategy, Lord Jesus, and get involved with the revolution of revival in this country. Help us to pray expediently, Lord Jesus, and be willing at all times to act upon what your Spirit leads us to do. Abolish all fear of man. I want to pray a prayer <clears throat> over you this morning. Jesus, let's ask you guys if you all repeat after me. Jesus, Take any fear I have of man and abolish it by your grace. Let your Holy Spirit come upon me. Anoint me. Bless me. Give me confidence. Give me assurance. And give me a refreshed hatred of sin. Lord, use me now as I go out into this fallen world to rescue the perishing, <clears throat> save the lost, and fulfill your command to love my neighbor as myself. I go now with confidence in the Holy Spirit. <clears throat>